Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the economy in 2014. A key theme this year is going to be that the West is back. The United States is going to perform at a sprint and is going to provide a very welcome impulse to the global economy. And the subtlety in that suggestion is that the East is going to be a source of consternation. In the East, in particular, the Chinese economy is going to slow. And of course, in markets particularly tightly associated with China, especially commodity markets, they are going to be troubled most, including Africa. Glancing at this exhibit, it becomes clear that for the most part, the rich world is going to do better this year than last year. The United States economy will grow by around 3% from 2% last year. Now, 3% for an economy that is $16 trillion in size is a pretty rapid pace of economic performance. And as I suggested in the opening remarks, the US will be the mainstay of the global economy's performance this year. If we cross the Atlantic, though, we welcome that Europe is growing again. After a lengthy period of recession, in fact, lasting one and a half years, Europe this year will grow by around 1%, after having contracted by half a percent last year. Now, Europe's challenges are not all behind it. There is still much unfinished business, especially with respect to completely restoring banks to full health. There is still much to be done in reforming the welfare system, and the labor market needs to become so much more productive. But that notwithstanding, there has been improvement. So, for instance, fiscal deficits in the region have halved. Unit labor costs are falling. In most parts, productivity is improving. And even in some of those larger economies, such as Portugal, Italy, and Spain, the current account deficits that were pretty substantial only a year ago are beginning to compress. So Europe appears to be on the mend, even if it isn't going to be sprinting in the manner that the United States is likely to perform. Going slightly more east and looking at the world's third largest economy, Japan, that experiment, Arbonomics, does appear to be yielding results. Last year, in fact, the performance of the Japanese economy was splendid, growing at almost 2% during the course of the year. Now, I say that splendid. If you consider that for much of the last decade, Japan, performed at a very shallow growth rate, near 0%, in fact, for the most part, a true period of lengthy malaise. But Arbonomics, and as some would suggest, an experiment does appear to be yielding results. In fact, in the first half of last year, the equity market was quite boisterous, growing at more than 17%. The currency over the last year has depreciated by well more than 25%, helping to inject a sense of competitiveness to Japanese industry, to Japanese product markets. We think this year Japan will slow a little because some of the reform measures that are being implemented, reform measures such as raising the tax rate, so as to get a more stable footing in terms of public finances, and so in the medium term to reduce spiraling indebtedness, that will weigh on the economy somewhat. But having said that, it does appear that Japan has got some chance of boosting growth in an enduring way, of ending deflation, and of reducing the spiral of rising debt. While we're talking about Japan, and we located in Asia, it's perhaps convenient to talk about the Chinese economy. China is slowing. And what is surprising is that China is slowing more than many had anticipated. And of course, that means, for instance, that commodity prices have been somewhat lower than many would have anticipated. Also, what is somewhat different this time is that the Chinese authorities, unlike in the past, when the economy slowed, they would have engaged in a stimulus program, but not this time. So the Chinese authorities have avoided a stimulus endeavor simply because they feel the quality of Chinese growth, especially in recent years, has been unwelcome. China, of course, was the epicenter of favorable, favorable growth in 2010 and 2011, when in fact the world was just emerging from the Great Recession, and the world needed a source of growth inspiration. 
but more recently that initial impulse of growth that was so centered on fixed investment has become somewhat of a challenge. Fixed investment in China is around 50% of GDP and credit in the Chinese economy is twice the size of GDP, which by any measure is simply an unhealthy state of affairs. So slow is the new normal in China and in fact it's part of a very important reforming process. This does not mean that Chinese are not going to get wealthy in the manner in which they have been improving their prosperity over the last two decades. In fact, it still remains quite possible that by 2020, the Chinese economy could surpass America as the world's largest economy. It seems nothing lasts forever. The US has been the world's largest economy since 1880. So it would seem after about 140 years, it is going to lose that top of the league table status to China, and even if it is a slightly slower growing China. Within the emerging markets fold, there is also going to be some underperformance in other zones. So for instance, in Latin America, led mainly by Brazil, that economy is likely to grow at not much better than 2.5% which is about half the type of growth rates Brazil enjoyed before the Great Recession of 2009. Brazil is being weighed under by elevated inflation, high interest rates, and quite simply Brazilians just don't invest sufficiently. So supply bottlenecks or infrastructure bottlenecks are beginning to contain even more livelier growth and it's unlikely to be remediated in the near term. So while Brazil will underperform in the markets, the financial markets and the goods and services markets. I guess the only good thing we can say is that in 2014, Brazil will win the 2014 FIFA World Cup for a record sixth time. And perhaps with that capture of the global economy split between the developed and the emerging markets, it's opportune to go into a discussion on the 